Hello and welcome to the First Time Founders Podcast, the show where we talk about how to start a business from nothing and grow into something meaningful. Today I'm talking with Scott Brown, the founder and chief visionary officer of Harriet Brown in-house legal recruitment. He's also the host of a podcast called Lessons I Learned in Law, because Scott, like me, is a reformed corporate lawyer, an escapee that managed to get out of uh, professional services, the life of the billable hour, uh, and move over to being an entrepreneur, having started his recruitment business. In this episode, we talk about what it's like making that transition from being a, uh, a lawyer, an esteemed lawyer, selling one's advice to, to corporate clients um, and or moving in-house to be, a, to be a trusted advisor within corporate legal departments, to the freewheeling, sales-driven life of a founder entrepreneur that needs to go win business in order to be able to you know, earn the customer support to go build an operation and ultimately develop and scale a company. Scott's an extremely thoughtful and honest and open guy about his own strength skills. And also the, the, the other side of that coin we all have as founders is, is, is limitations um, or the things he's not interested in. We share a lot of those actually in common. And I think if you, if, if you relate to, to that, you should find some, some really good tips in this episode as to how you can structure your organization and team up with other people to, to ensure that collectively you bring your very best to the market to, to be a great place for employees to work and for clients to, to buy into your product or service. So without further ado, my conversation with Scott Brown. Scott, welcome to the First Time Founders Podcast. Thank you for doing this, my friend. Thanks for having me. Good to, good to be here. Good, to, uh, good for the, sh- the boot to be on the other foot. <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk about your podcast and all the different things you've done. I mean, I'm excited. This is my first sort of public discussion of the Reformed Lawyers Club. Uh, there's, a, there's a growing band of us, right? In, in order to people know what I'm smirking about and referring to here, what's your background, Scott? And then we'll get into your business and how it got started. Yeah, cheers. Um, yeah, good to be joined by by another fellow. Um, I, I sort of ban myself as a recovering a recovering lawyer, so I um, I qualified as a lawyer in two thousand and two thousand and ten two thousand and nine I think me um, uh, yeah going going back a bit and um, qualified into corporate law and worked at a firm which is now under Adelshaw Goddard which is a, a sort of large international um great firm um and then that took me to australia worked there for a few years as a um, again project slash corporate lawyer so working on wind farms and the the, the buying and selling of, of wind farms um and really didn't um really never clicked that that was that, that was me and i now um I'm now founder of um, a, a legal recruitment business, so stuck um, a bit to what I know, um, but, but I had a bit of a career a career switch um, on moving back to Australia, and uh, that led to me founding Harriet Brown in house legal recruitment. So that's um, that's my business as it is today. I love talking to you. Must get this as well. I love talking to people that are still practicing, and of course, you get some people that love legal practice, and it and and it's it's awesome. I guess particularly in your business, when you find someone that was just put on this earth to be an amazing lawyer, and you can help them advance their career. But you also get a lot of frustrated lawyers, don't you? That are sort of yeah. pe- peering enviously over the fence about what it looks like on, on the other side, on the entrepreneurial side of the fence. What do you tell them when they ask that? Um, I think the same as I would tell anyone. It's it's not. Um, I don't think it's all it's cut out to be. And like it's <laughs> it's a hard it's a hard graft. It, 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 there's there's a lot of uncertainty, and it was a very different. Um, uh, like I've I've had that conversation more and more recently with with a few people who are who are pretty senior, and thinking about making a making a career switch and. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I don't think it's for everyone. I think the legal profession's got some amazing, like, innovative angles to it that you that you, that's there to explore as well. Um, but uh, but yeah, not for the faint-hearted. I think in terms of moving into that entrepreneurial seat, and you have to know it's. I think you have to know it's for you and have a a, a real purpose to it. Yeah, totally. I mean, what have you learned about yourself since um, since becoming? A, I mean, I hate the term. I'm sure you do too. But since becoming an entrepreneur, yeah. Um, oh, it's like, it's, I guess it's a bit of an evolution in, um, in that. So, I mean, I, I, I go back to being like what I was like when I was a lawyer and that's, that's sort of pre, 
pre-recruitment, getting into a, a different industry and a really different mindset. Um, and I, yeah, I, I sort of, <laughs> I'm a bit aghast or uh, as to how I, I maybe viewed myself as well and the limitations that I put on myself um, and boxed myself in. Um, I was never really that confident in the, the corporate structure that I was in as a lawyer. And all, all this is said with hindsight. So at the time, of I just course. thought I was a really, really poor lawyer, not good <laughs> at my job, um, didn't have the energy in going to work, couldn't really quite, or was envious looking at the, the grass is greener at my friends that were perhaps in corporate jobs as well and were thriving and, and were talking passionately about what it is that they did. And I, I, I didn't really ever have that. And it wasn't really the fault of anyone that I was working with. Um but moving, yeah, moving into recruitment, there's a whole career change there, and and it was a career change rather than just a straight jump into entrepreneurialism. So I, I worked for um, Taylor Root, which is a large um, uh, legal recruitment business, and, and moving back to London. And I think then that sales mindset, that's when that's when my head really switched and thought, all right, okay, the people that I've got in most organisations. The, the people that have got this the say or the people that have they're impacting that business are commercial they're, they're probably driving sales and being like a, a sales function um and that was the first real sort of switch and, and light bulb um and it, it it certainly clicked for me and motivated me anyway i i found the exact same thing like i um it's interesting i i i worked so hard to get into my law firm um that i think i just found it very difficult to accept that i it just wasn't what I was put on the earth to do. And I'm somewhat competitive. So I, it really depressed me knowing that I was only ever going to be an average lawyer, <laughs> even if I worked my, my absolute hardest, because I just, no matter how hard I work, I can't hold all of the details in my mind. And over a, a long enough period of time, I'll yeah. just want to get the deal done rather than like, like I always wanted to play striker rather than goalkeeper. And I felt a bit, emba- <laughs> felt a bit embarrassed about the ego aspect of that. And I can yeah. see you grinning. Yeah. Ah, oh, like that just resonates exactly, like spot on for me. I never felt I was going to be the the go to. I never felt I was going to be an, uh, successful in that market. And, and and again, what I've learned is you enjoy and try try to encourage this within our team. Like you enjoy you enjoy what you're good at, and you're good at what you enjoy. And like I was never. I never had that when I was a lawyer. I always looked at the partners. They're the the sales guys. They're the guys that are going out doing business development. I thought, oh, I could be that. That looks great Um, and exciting and and, um, high level and strategic. But the thought of grafting for 15 years as an associate to get there um, didn't didn't quite do it for me. Um, But, yeah, the, the, the competitive aspect of it as well, like, yeah, I think I think I'm I'm probably too like too competitive in things. I think it's it works in recruitment, but I, I absolutely hate I hate losing or I hate missing out on stuff. Um, yeah, it's it's um, I had a similar path to you in that I left law and um, I left in 2009 when the legal industry was deregulating. So there was this mm. weird mo- there was this weird moment in time where you had a load of technologists and quote business people wanting to come in and show the lawyers how to run their industry. It was pretty arrogant, but I mean, that was the vibe at the time. And yeah. they were, they needed sort of ambitious young people that were not ashamed to sort of sell, but that could navigate the legal industry and legal culture. Mm-hmm. And so despite my lack of commercial or sales experience, I kind of got in that way. I, I was more lawyer than salesperson, but they could kind of teach me the sales side of things. And I remember really vividly, there was a time the guy I worked for gave me this speech where he said, um, you're not in a time business anymore. You're in an output based business yeah. and um, just coming in early and leaving late and me seeing the, the jacket on the back of your chair is not going to save your job if you don't achieve anything. And equally, I don't care how many lunches you, you eat and I don't care how <laughs> many drinks you drink on my credit card if you're out there bringing value into the marketplace and we're capturing some of it. And I was like, yeah solid solid advice (laughs) Um, amazing advice but did did it did it take you a while to get used to uh, like not getting rewarded for any degree of presenteeism or did that come quite naturally for you i think I, i think it 
I, th- I think it really it, it was what I was it was what I was looking for. Like I, the presenteeism was one of the biggest things that I just couldn't get my head around in like six minute billable units in private practice, and couldn't really see any value to the client. I always felt whenever I was a corporate lawyer, so you were doing deals based on hourly rates. You probably the partners would quote or give at least a fee estimate on what the what the outcome would be for the client. You have this big celebration or like champagne bottle moment when the deal gets done, papers papers are signed, the invoice goes out about three days later, and the <laughs> are there, and the clients inevitably would question every single. I like I didn't have visibility on all of that, of course, but it felt like there was a massive pushback from clients, and you're like, what was the oh, value have we added there? Why did we not? Why did we not? I don't know. They can structure things. You can structure things slightly differently, or communication can be better. Something. So having it, having been in an environment where you can delegate, you can sort of outsource stuff, you can maybe cut a few corners in a sales environment as well. It's um, that 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 clicked with me. Um, I think there's other things that that, that haven't, but um, but yeah, it's it's uh, and then that that I think sets you up for, for entrepreneurial entrepreneurism who was who was that with on the on the legal on the legal tech side or the, within that uh, so so i ended up being a director for do you remember capita capita yeah. they're, they're small now but for a while they were like footsie 100 mm-hmm. um they did like those big outsourcing contracts mm. and um, they got teased in private eye for being crapita <laughs> like, yeah, right. allegedly mismanaging local authority contracts so you can imagine what that was like trying to go in with that brand to, to these high, <laughs> highfalutin law firms and and corporate legal departments but they they acquired a um, a law firm up in leeds that had the alternate business structure license yeah and so the idea was that they'd go in and do yeah like sort of volume legal work across all the areas that that people were saying were going to be commoditized at the time yeah and so i i went to there via some of the outsourcers nice yeah that was an exciting that was an exciting time like i, I looked that was probably the that was what I was researching when I was stuck in in Sydney working as a lawyer and I was looking for my way out. I landed on sales and I landed, I'll stick with something related to law. And I was looking at all these alternative business structures. There was a lot more happening in the UK than in um, in London. And, and sorry, in Australia at that point, it was a few years ahead. But that excited me because it was doing, it was marketed differently. It was doing, like you said, I'd, like it was it was uh, disrupting Um I, I thought my, my my initial thought had been, I'll, I'll move back to London. Um, personal circumstances was taking taking us back there. I'll get a job there for a year in one of these businesses, and then I'll go and do it myself. So I always did have, I always had a mm, inclination that I was gonna, yeah. I suppose you set up a business that's either something brand new or you, you try to do something slightly better than than one of your competitors is is doing. Well, I think, I mean, I, look, I admire what you did in terms of um, staying in the legal world. I, I think, I mean, I, I went, founded Jabster, which was a software company um, selling like mobile communication software to retailers and hospitality organizations. So nothing connected to what yeah. I was doing. But the transition was because um, I was trying to get Marks and Spencer to buy legal software, legal outsourcing <laughs> technology for Capita, because Capita had all these big institutional relationships so you could go into big companies and of course Marks and Spencer were not remotely interested in saving like 10p on their legal function by taking a load of perceived risk for automating stuff at the time but I found out they had 85,000 employees but only 15,000 company email addresses so I was like so you've got 70,000 people that aren't on Office 365 (laughs) the GDPR is coming like they can't keep talking to each other on WhatsApp that's ridiculous Mm -hmm. and so it was sort of tangentially connected to my legal insight because I thought it was going to be all about GDPR compliant messaging and of course as it turned out the um the gdpr didn't force every large employer to to give their you know their frontline people secure yeah. communication technology so i then had to <laughs> learn to sell the hard way and learn that those industries that i knew nothing about whereas if i'd have had the discipline to stay in the market i knew the customer profile i understood i.e the legal department or legal practice I'm sure I still would have made tons of mistakes, but at least I wouldn't have had to like <laughs> relearn a new customer market. So I take my hat off to you. Although I'm sure sometimes you look outside of legal and think, I wish I could sell to some different types of people. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think like the, like being able to have the foresight to look at the opportunity there that you've, that you've identified and, and see that there's a gap. That's the, 
that's that's the piece that differentiates right and and taking a risk on it and it being like there's a lot of things that add up in terms of being like right time of life and like having the hunger to go and do that um uh yeah i i don't know if it was like i think the thing i um the thing i look at anyone i, I don't think everything and and what I would tell myself if I was back as a student, I don't think anything's really mapped out and, and, and clear, although you get in, like both of us have been in the legal profession where it is quite, it's very linear in terms of what progress looks like or, or might look like in the traditional sense. Um, you have to be on, you have to be on your toes and react to something that, that might be a bit left field and, and have your eyes open and take a risk sometimes. And, 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 it, and it, um, yeah, my brother, my brother's got a recruitment business, so it wasn't a, a, an industry that was completely, completely new to me. A lot more successful than that, or a lot bigger than our our business um, at the moment. But um, <laughs> he was like, like, even when I was when I was taking the uh, taking the step to to set up Harriet Brown, it was like generally like people want to people want you to do well in the world, and and yeah, if you've got if you've got a sort of an open mind to things and you ask questions then um yeah hopefully things work out it's um but yeah easy, easier said i guess easier said than done well I, look, I think one of the things that's interesting about recruitment particularly in legal and professional services is the the people are the differentiating factor right mm. I, I mean i know a bit different in house um i probably just didn't understand that when i when, when i was a lawyer so you now specialize in placing lawyers into corporate organizations right because those that are listening to this there might be some lawyers but it'll also just be a lot of ge- yeah. general founders can you talk a little bit about the harriet bound product as in sort of why people would choose you and what um when you put a great candidate into an organization like what does that generally look like like what are your sort of proudest moments when a deal gets completed where you know you've added a ton more value to the client than your fee Mm. um so so yeah so just to explain explain a a little around what we do and why so we place lawyers into in-house in-house positions so that's working in industry so like most professions or corporate functions you you could work in an accountancy firm as an accountant and move and work work with an industry um they're very different my my opinion is they're very different careers to working as a as a fee earning lawyer working for a law firm where you're you've got multiple clients um and it is a career switch for the lawyers at that stage so we've chosen to continue and and uh continue to, and that's our mission to purely focus on the in-house market and it's for me, there's a lot from what I see. I I, I had a very little, uh, a very small experience working in house, but generally, um, I find that lawyers are more fulfilled in that environment. They're looked upon as like business advisors, trusted trusted partners, adding value to whichever business they're working for, rather than a, a, a sort of expense that's that's brought in at the at the house moment. So why? Why Harriet Brown? For me, we've invested a lot in terms of branding and marketing and to be the go-to, like our mission is to be the go-to within um, for in-house legal. A lot of our competitors focus on both private practice and, and, and in-house. And like I said, I think there, there there's some great re- legal recruitment businesses out there. I, I find that being known for one thing and one niche and exploring that and that I'll get onto our sort of goals for, for the future in terms of dominating that market to be the go-to. Um, that's, that's the sort of, that's the really important thing for us as, as our business in terms of, um, in terms of the, the, the point on satisfaction at our clients and how, how we deliver again, we're only speaking to people about the in-house market. So the, the consultants and everyone that works within our business is ingrained in that space um and is hopefully aligned with the fact that it's a career change and for lawyers and it's a it's a big move making that first move but the value add that you're giving to to both the candidate and the client is um is clear so the biggest reward for me in in placing um i'm I'm slightly removed from the recruitment day to day um at, at the moment but the biggest reward's always been for me is that left field candidate who thought, oh, I've, do you know what? I've been pigeonholed into something that I didn't, I don't really see myself as an in-house lawyer, but 
getting them and coaching them to understand that it's about them as an individual rather than exactly what they've been doing when they've been working in a law firm and that nothing's impossible. You're only three years, four years into your legal career. Like they're going to hire you for you and then teach the, there's going to be a steep learning curve anyway. So I've always found that the most rewarding when you get that left field candidate, they're a job that they never thought was really possible. Um, And uh, yeah, the feedback, the feedback you get from there and, and equally, getting a client to think a little bit outside the box and, and look, look at the individual rather than purely the, the CV. That's interesting. Do you mind if we just dig into that a little bit? And then I'd love to talk about stepping away from the recruitment more like leading and managing. Mm. Um, is it is it possible to sort of summarise the value of bringing someone left field? Because I think that's actually something that a lot of founders listening will be able to um, to derive value from, even if they're not, not working in and around legal because i i think i can picture some people that have been transformational for my businesses yeah that, that weren't from sort of central casting but you've obviously got much more experience of that than me when you say that do you have people in mind that you picture from your past i mean you can't name them but i'm just interested yeah. in what characteristics they had that made them special outside yeah. of the norm um the well i think for, i think the benefits are like like diver- diversity in in the team and people coming from different different backgrounds and then skill sets um and bringing bringing a different way of looking at like again if we're talking of the the micro here in in the legal sense someone that generally typically our clients will want a commercial lawyer so someone that's negotiated saas contracts or something something along those lines bringing someone who's a litigator or something into that space, they're looking at uh, things from a different angle. They're assessing risks. They're looking at what like, they're, they're probably looking at, like what's gone wrong with these contracts further down the line. Um, so yeah, that would be my, that would be my sort of atypical um, left, like left field candidate into that. In, that's, in that's such a great example. Cause I remember when I was a corporate lawyer, we'd shit ourselves when the litigation colleagues yeah. had to come and look at one of your deals. <laughs> yeah. 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 So they're like, they can see where it, they can see where everything goes wrong and know what the, know, know what pitfalls to look out for. Um, uh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah. You don't want, you basically as a, on that side, as a, either a business person or a corporate lawyer, you just want, those contracts to be buried and not to be if, if they see the light of day again that someone's admiring your handiwork then it's if something's somebody's uh somebody's screwed up somewhere so um in terms of like how to summarize them or what you look for i think it goes for anyone um people ge- like generally that impress um in those circumstances and again it goes into hiring into our business and, and looking at people that I uh, that inspire um I think like a natural curiosity is is one of the I just think it's the the biggest uh, it's not a skill is it but it's, it's one of the most important things and differentiators I see within six then defining success like being yeah, genuinely interested in what something say someone saying, um, whatever subject matter your 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 or whatever career path you're on, to be genuinely interested in it. And again, I look back to my <laughs> the time as a lawyer, and I I don't remember any time being that interested in the legal stuff. I remember being interested in the clients' businesses, and oh god, that's interesting. What like what they do, but the the subject matter wasn't like it wasn't it wasn't doing it for me so um yeah i, I think that's asking asking further questions I, like and again f- from a candidate or client side it, it always is you're like all oh, right good yeah you've got that you've got a bit of a spark in your eye um or interest in your voice as to what you're what you're asking about and asking the right questions Totally. And I think where people are genuinely passionate for the the work, the actual specialism can come fairly quickly. I mean, I, and I'm sure, and again, we'll talk about leadership and management in a sec, like, but the, a nice segue is during my ride as the founder CEO of Yapster, I, um, I, I had some great suppliers and some, some really great colleagues. I also made some spectacular mis, mishires on suppliers and colleagues. And it, it, it was partly the same as the mistake everybody else makes confirmation bias getting on well with someone assuming because they had a practicing certificate in the given thing um that they'd just be able to do the technical stuff like it's really popular with commercial law firms i think to be like 
well, we're all good at the law. How we differentiate ourselves is sector specialism and culture. And you're like, that's easy to believe. Actually, like not everyone is good at the law. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, a lot of people are actually terrible at the law or or management accounting or like corporate finance, it turns Mm -hmm. out, or data, you know, any of these things. And it was was amazing. I mean, it was brutal learning the difference between abdication and delegation. But like, I mean, if you you don't know it going in, you definitely know it coming out, right? So (laughs) everything you're saying makes sense. And and that feels like a knowing chuckle to me, Scott. So like, obviously, we've got to protect the innocent of any colleagues or suppliers you've worked with in the past. But like, what what are some of the things you've learned on the sort of the people leadership side of, I mean, leadership is, is only, is only second in entrepreneurship to sort of douchey terms for a podcast like this, but go with me. What have you you, you learned? Yeah. um, So leadership. um, I, yeah, I, I've, I don't think I've ever really considered myself like a leader. I think it's, um, I'd go back to like, I'd go back to like playing football and stuff when I was younger and being, I, I remember being um, on certain age groups at school being like team captain and um, on occasion at university being either deputy captain and stuff. I, I always felt a little bit like mm, uneasy in the, in, in what it meant. Um so I think I'm I'm reluctant leader. I I do um I enjoy it. I like enjoy leading from the front and um what's really been the um the turning point for me in 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 it is having a bit of a a north star in our values at, um at Harriet Brown. Um and that and that point came when I, I worked with a I worked with a consultant um a, a sort of good good friend in contact who has been in recruitment for a lot longer than I have and, and sitting down and really defining like what what good looks like for us, why we do what we do and and um and, and defining some some values, both like current values and aspirational values. Um and I've found that since that point in time, which was I don't know, halfway through COVID lockdown, um, lost track of lost track of months, but <laughs> that was that gave like right, okay, we've got like we, I know I now know what I'm communicating and what what behaviours I'm looking to um, exemplify to the team and and what I'm looking for within within the team as well. Um, so that that has really helped me along in terms of leadership because I know what I'm what I'm leading because before that I think I'm naturally quite opportunistic and, and that leads to me being a bit changeable in terms of I'll chase one thing and chase the next. Uh, and it's a little bit, yeah, I think having that guide, guiding principle and principles are, is really important. Um, so, so yeah, that, that would be my, that would be a, a big, like defining that earlier on would have been a big, um, a big thing. And I think it would have helped. Um, yeah. I, I found the exact same thing. It was interesting because law firms are so, seemingly particular about how and who they recruit but they're not very specific about what their values are and the behaviors they expect to see outside of technical competency on the way in or actually when you do your kind of periodic performance reviews either or at least my law firm wasn't mm-hmm. and so i'd never seen and then i went straight into kind of entrepreneurial sales also fairly loose organizations culturally mm-hmm. so i'd never seen a disciplined recruitment process based on values and then um real-time consistent rolling feedback on performance yeah against role attributes and yeah. once you've seen that you kind of can't unsee it can you and when yeah. I- all out the values but like just interested can you summarize the gist of what sort of behaviors you expect to see in Harry Brown particularly if there are things that would be unique to you versus other recruitment businesses serving maybe the same market like are there any like unique values that you that spring to mind yeah like if for me like, the big things are like if something's right you do it immediately like if 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 something's like we're in a, a a very competitive industry in recruitment and in, in legal it's it is it is really um competitive um and there's no shortage of uh, no shortage of other recruitment businesses that are that are waiting to eat your lunch so it's like that's that's really like that immediacy and, and being like really like be able, being able to understand what needs done right now and prioritize um 
the other is like it goes back to like fulfilling fulfilling careers for lawyers like having that as our guiding principle so it, it undermines how we interact with people what our what our goals are we're never pushing for a like we're in sales so we want things to happen but you can also take a step back and know that right there's an investment in a relationship here that goes beyond the next three months of commission it's it's about is this the right move for that person and and sometimes we may say like listen this probably isn't right for you like the stuff you're saying doesn't align with what your motivations were when we initially met with you same with clients that sometimes means missing out on stuff um and we don't get those right all the time either it's it's hard like some of them are like it's constantly you're constantly evolving but having them as um as values i think what is what differentiates and i've worked in businesses before like the law firms and the businesses i've worked in most companies have values and they're communicated on day one and written on the wall or or whatever bloody hard to like instill them across the business and maintain them and and i'm sure we'll have challenges as we're growing and growing pains and areas where we can improve on that front um i don't i don't see it as being a a standstill and and not open for changing so it's um yeah i think that's that's a hard a hard thing to get right yeah, no, I, I, I found the very same thing. What would you say are the aspects of transitioning into your your current role, and particularly at the top, you know, the top of your organisation? Mm-hmm. Um, what are the area, What are the areas of that job that you found most most challenging? I'm happy to confess my sins afterwards too. <laughs> um, uh, managing, managing, um, managing people in our in our business. Not that. Um, We've got great people um, and have had great people. Um, it's it's more the discipline for me personally in managing and, and what's involved in that. And yeah, it, it, a lot of it's organisational and, and being like being on top of um, <laughs> on top of follow ups or uh, <laughs> holding holding each other to account, holding people within our within our team to account. Um, and and yeah, the the I have a meeting today. Two weeks time, we'll do this. I, I like man, keep it on top of that stuff. I just found it, uh, I find it quite um quite difficult um because I get because <laughs> I get distracted. I probably get distracted too easily. Um, so by, by, by the way, I'm only laughing because I feel exactly the same, and it's right. hila- it's hilarious that we were both lawyers. Like you couldn't pick a worse uh, temperament for being know, a lawyer. I know attention to detail like, <laughs> and follow yeah, up out the window. Yeah, what well, did you did you find that as well? Uh, so it's interesting. So for me, it was two things. It was firstly that I didn't know what good light looked like because I'd never seen that, so I couldn't mirror it. Yeah, and then I don't have the natural um, personality to just find myself a naturally good manager I had to Mm. see it so that I could mirror it and then I could do it 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 still drains my energy so it's not I'll never be a world-class operator Mm -hmm. Um, I'm much better at sort of evangelizing and seeing what the future might look like and who the stakeholders you need to bring together to make that happen Mm -hmm. but in order to then execute on the vision that we've all just joyfully held hands and painted together I really need to work alongside somebody that's really good at numbers and Mm -hmm like pathological about making sure that shit gets done like mm-hmm. which i'm which i'm i'm not really um yeah. so so i learned that the hard way i read i failed read books and then i was like oh right so good management typically involves being really clear with people about what you expect in terms of how they're going to do things like you talked about values and then what you want them to do role attributes telling them clearly making sure they've understood that and then following up like relentlessly mm-hmm. um so that you like deliver on that and because uh, again a bit like the lawyer thing where they say oh you know everybody's good at their job we just care about values um you also hear about like i don't like to be micromanaged and so i think you grow up sometimes in professional services thinking micromanagement is bad and then you mm-hmm. meet a world-class operator and they're all over the detail they leave people alone when they're performing in their job if they're yeah. not performing in their job they're on it like a hawk yeah yeah it's, it's uh... Yeah, like everything everything you've said sort of uh, again strikes strikes a chord, and I can see I can see parts of it that I would, yeah, again re- some of it retrospectively or in hindsight, but yeah, having not seen it again, I, I don't know if that would. I remember being at the, the the previous recruitment firm that I was in, and yeah, not going through there. I left after about fifteen months and set up Harriet Brown. Um, I had no intention of. I didn't want to manage people for other people, and uh, yeah. and. Um, 
yeah, I, I, but having not been exposed to that and seeing what that's even hindered me in putting in structure into the team and having like career progression for the team in the past. So, um, so yeah, we just we just hired a managing director. So yeah, I've I've hired a managing director into our um, UK or for growing our growing our business. Um, which is really I was going to ask and, I was going to yeah. ask you about that. What what sort of um, How's he different to you? Like, what, yeah. what, what? Just awesome if you could just, just because I think that would be helpful for founders listening. If you've, if you found that set you free a little bit, like, why, it, why is that that he was the right person for a job that you didn't feel you were the right person for? Yeah. Um, so yeah, James is 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 um, fantastic. Um, for he's been in, he's, he's been with us for five five months now. Um, he. Um, he has that. He, he like we did before he joined. We did the and, and uh, we had offered and accepted by this point in time. So the, the the horse had perhaps bolted, but luckily it was uh it was still very good. We we did like, insights um discovery and um together and sort of oh, did, a, nice. did a session on uh, or a couple of sessions on um personalities and and what what makes us as tick. Um, he's very much sunshine sunshine yellow i forget these words i forget these um this terminology wrong then uh he, he sits on that front so people person um extrovert uh, things that motivate him in terms of bringing people along and, and getting sort of com- camaraderie in the team there's parts of my profile touched upon that but more on the red on the red side so um, <laughs> like roy Keane. Uh, yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, I'll take that. Um, yeah, so so yeah, I, th- I think the, he, he's much more meticulous. I mean, he's come from he's done fourteen years in industry and recruitment, scaled scaled a business, um, scaled a recruitment business, and and managed managed teams sort of forty and above um, uh, in in various locations. So. Um, is is just on it in terms of the management like you could see immediately in terms of like buy-in from the from the guys in the team um little like you said defining roles and the simple things like you've you've sort of outlined defining someone's roles what their objectives are and setting some targets um we're just i mean we're just glaringly missing from when i was uh. when i was managing a team which <laughs> i i like um the ego part of me is like, oh God, why can't I do that? Or like, I, I should be able to do that. Or and I, I know that, but like actually executing it, I just it doesn't. Um, you used a good phrase of like giving the energy. It's it's not. Um, it's, and I could see that I wasn't adding much value to the the, the people I was managing um, at at that point in time from a day to day basis. So um, it was just it was right. Um, <laughs> I, I found the exact same thing. It was interesting. I mean, the reason I qualified in the entrepreneurial operating system was because I found it sort of set me free for exactly the reasons you described. It enabled mm. me to understand enough of a holistic s- system for decent management that I could delegate rather than abdicate. And then put that, I mean, in EOS terms, they call it an integrator. And right. um, the system literally says that you'll, you'll quite often have a visionary and an integrator. And if you're not a total Muppet, you don't really want to be the visionary because like it, you feel a bit embarrassed to be a mm. quote visionary mm. while someone else like does everything. But actually, because the system's quite prescriptive about it, you have to be honest about which seat you sit in. Mm-hmm. And then you feel less precious about going into the visionary seat and sort of supporting somebody that's more of a natural integrator. But, yeah. but because they were then integrating a system that I was a part of, albeit not an executing part of, right. I didn't feel like I'd just given my business away maybe to somebody that was great, but perhaps lacked some of the things that are valuable that I bring to the organization. And so I've wrestled with the same thing. I know loads of founders do. It, it's hard. Like visionaries tend to start companies because they they don't look at a field and just see all of the pitfalls. They see the magical golden path across to the promised land. Like if you didn't have visionaries, most of the best things in the world wouldn't exist. Mm. I thought, but if we only had visionaries, most of the things in the world wouldn't exist either because we'd all be stuck in ditches. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's awesome. Um, um, no, I totally get it. I think your candor will really help a lot of people also um, because I, my guess is a lot of legal, if we've got lawyers listening that are aspiring entrepreneurs, they mm. might be more in the James mold, right? Or in the integrator mold that I just described. Yeah. It's a really good um, team for an entrepreneurial management team yeah um 
And I think there's parts of like there's there's definitely there's uh, cringe at the, the the visionary. I've given although I've given myself a chief visionary t- officer title, I, which I, I love it. I couldn't I, I couldn't bring myself on the CEO um, title with hiring, <laughs> hiring James. But um, it's I think there's I think there's like visionary attributes in everyone, and I think everyone's got the ability to 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 do it. It's, it's there's 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 aspects of just getting out there and getting done and like touched on earlier the risks and and time of life like I I, I don't I, I don't take that for granted at all I was very fortunate when I was in taking that step had to take a massive earning cut in terms of um or at least short-term guaranteed earnings to go into that to go into a sales role what's effectively a sales role in recruitment um and fortunate to have a amazing wife that's that's got a, a very good a very good job and income stream at that at that point in time and, and still has so it, it allows you to take um that allows you to take risks or it makes the risk seem slightly more manageable um and, and similarly when taking the step to to set up um to set up the business it was um de-risk to some extent but you're still you're still taking a you're still taking a risk and um yeah, the lawyer, and you could say, "Oh God, I'm chucking away eight years of nine years, ten years of study and um, <laughs> uh, everything that I've done, blood, sweat, and tears for for what?" So, yeah, for a dream. For a dream. No, I can mm. relate. Same thing. I was lucky to have a really supportive fa- family around me too. Um, Scott, this has been amazing. If there are people that are, that are watching or listening that are frustrated lawyers, you know, that, yeah. that either want to be entrepreneurs or maybe just want to try something new to bring a bit of vigor back into their life. Are you happy that I put the contact details in the show notes and folks just reach out to you, LinkedIn or email or whatever? Yeah, please. Um, I'm always on as most recruiters are. I'm, I'm pretty tapped into LinkedIn. So that's the easiest way to drop me a DM or yeah, put my, share my, share my email details. Happy to, happy to have a chat. And yeah, it's, it's good to, it's good to hear people in similar, I guess, similar positions and help out.